to backlash the environmental movement. Uh, I'll get it correct uh, uh, eventually here, but we're very delighted to uh, have this topic uh, raised here today. And uh, Tom Lavelli, uh, an undergraduate student, will be uh, with the Environmental Action Committee, has helped to bring us together uh, on this topic, and he will be uh, moderating the questions after our speaker has finished. Uh, but we're particularly pleased to have uh, Douglas LaFollette, uh, whose uh, technical title is uh, uh, Wisconsin Secretary of State, uh, where he is a public office holder, and he has been uh, for a number of years in that, both that position and held other uh, public offices. But what brings him to our topic, of course, is his uh, extraordinary experience uh, as an organizer, as an advocate, as an author uh, on environmental questions. He brings a scientific background to this. Uh, he's probably the only Secretary of State in the United States who has a PhD in organic, organic chemistry, and he was engaged in, uh, uh, on a faculty teaching uh, science, uh, so he brings a special scientific background to this public policy. But of course, this is an issue that uh, grew over the years uh, to become one of the most significant in American uh, politics and certainly most one of the significant questions to many of us individually and collectively in this society. And he was, uh, in a, some sense, there at the beginning. He was uh, one of the uh, key organizers for bringing about the 1970 Earth Day uh, celebration or program, which were, uh, and then again to celebrate his 20th anniversary in 1990. Uh, what uh, younger folks in our audience may not recognize is just how significant uh, this event was at, at the time and what it became in terms of public education uh, in my own congressional district at the time. I was not in office, but running for office. It became a mode of, of discussion, of organizing, of bringing people together, getting public attention, and getting people engaged in small towns in Indiana that I came to represent. And this was the pattern, I believe, all across America. Uh, at a time when we were just beginning to uh, really wake up. Uh, it was on top of some of the actions in the 60s, but really wake up to how profound uh, this question was. And he was a key uh, leader in getting this, uh, this started and getting it on the public agenda. And he also has been the author of a book called The Survival uh, Handbook. So if you'll welcome this very distinguished uh, gentleman to the forum, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Douglas LaFollette. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and to see a nice audience and a, on a rainy Friday afternoon when I'm sure there's other things you could think of to do. I've been here for a, a, about a day and a half so far and had a very good experience so far meeting with students and professors. And uh, I actually taught a class yesterday, which was fun. I like doing that. So I got to teach a class on environmental justice and enjoyed that and met with students last night at dinner in the dining hall, had excellent food and uh, an excellent, excellent conversation with a uh, professor and some students. I'm going to get right to the topic because there's a lot to talk about. I'm going to try to summarize 27 years in, uh, in an hour here and then take some questions from you. The, the topic, uh, I didn't mean to make it a tongue twister, but the topic was designed to sort of not only get your attention, but dramatize where we've been and where we are, namely black smoke, to backlash, 25 years of Earth Days or a history of the, of the U.S. environmental movement. I think the first thing I want to do, uh, given the fact that uh, some of the audience uh, are somewhat younger than I am, uh, give you a little a kind of early history of how this whole thing started. And uh, I'm going to only go back to about 1950. Let, let me do a question. Can you still hear me when I leave the microphone? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try to stay somewhat close to it. If you can't hear me, just go ahead and wave and I'll wander back. I'm not going to be too far too long. But I'm going to go back to 1950, just kind of as a starting point. And I think that's significant uh, because around 1950, the word environment probably didn't exist other than possibly in the dictionary or in a few academic uh, situations where, where professors of biology, uh, to some extent, were beginning to think about the environment. But it hadn't become a discipline yet. You couldn't study it, et cetera. And the period up to, say, 1970 is significant, I think. And this is my own theory, and I haven't, quote, published it, so, so, so no one, no one has uh, had a chance to peer review it. But I think that those 20 years were instrumental 
in, in sort of a backhanded way of bringing about the first Earth Day. And the reason I say that is during this 20 years in the United States, and I'm dealing primarily with the U.S. in this talk today, something happened that was very significant. And what happened was, during this period, the real after inflation income of the average American doubled. Now that's a tremendous amount of wealth to dump onto a large number of people in a very short time. And of course, we also were following the war and all of the technology that had been developed and the pent up demand led to, to basically sort of a, a unregulated growth, if you will, because we didn't have any environmental regulations and there was a lot of growth. The chemical industry boomed, the auto industry boomed, the interstate highways boomed, and we had a tremendous amount of growth and consumption, and it was unregulated, basically. Well, what happened, obviously, uh, is that the effects of that begin to show up. And I've taught a course in the environment. I st sometimes I do a one-week course, sometimes I do a two-week course. I used to do a whole uh, semester course when I was back at the university. So I'm going to give you uh, the two-minute course on the environment. Assuming that this group has had serious courses on the environment, I can be superficial. But basically, I summarize it with the, what I hope is now famous iPad equation. How many people know the iPad equation in this audience? Well, maybe I may need more environmental education than I thought. What that stands for is the impact on the environment, the pollution, the resource usage, the strip mines, whatever negative impacts are there, is a result of three different factors in society which work together in a, in a, in a multiplicable way, a synergistic way. And those are population, affluence, and technology. And population came first, maybe to make it e easy to pronounce, but I think because it's probably the, one of the most serious issues, and we'll probably talk some more about that later. So if you analyze what was going on in this country, vis-a-vis -vis this sort of analysis, you begin to see that as the population was increasing, the affluence of the United States was going up tremendously, as I indicated, and the technological uh, implications of many new technologies from chemicals to, 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 to garbage disposals to television to the, the airline industry, all those things were coming online and that led therefore to a tremendous impact. Well, by the late 60s, it had reached a point where people were beginning to notice it and there are some famous cases that, that all we environmentalists with a gray hair or two talk about and they are such as the following. One is the famous Cuyahoga River, which is in Cleveland, I believe, and it, quote, caught fire. I mean, it was so polluted with, with, with uh, oil and chemicals that it, it supported combustion. I wasn't there. I don't know how much it could supported, but it was sufficient that that could become a story where it actually, it was polluted enough that, that it did support combustion uh, maybe briefly. In Pittsburgh, one weekend, they had an air inversion problem where due to the, the temperatures inversion, the, the, the dirty air of Pittsburgh, which at that time was very dirty compared to the Pittsburgh of today, got trapped and 26 people died over the weekend from air pollution related illnesses. Many of them were elderly people or children, people who have asthma, emphysema, situations like that. And uh, in Wisconsin, where I know it very well, we had a river called the Fox River which literally had no fish. I mean, it was a stinking cesspool industrial river. There were no fish left in the Fox River. Again, there might have been some, but the general conversation was that the fish were gone. And there were pipes where you could go out if you, and you could take your students or you could go out with a camera and get a, 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 an outfall pipe where basically g green gobs of guck were going directly into rivers and, and lakes, something you would be very hard pressed to find today in this country. And coming out of the smokestacks, and that's where my title comes from, and there was one just next to the university where I was teaching, 20 miles away, uh, called the Oak Creek Power Plant that had three big smokestacks out of which black smoke literally flowed most all the time. We actually brought a lawsuit against that power company about three years later under a Wisconsin law that was passed and got them to put on electrostatic precipitators and stop the black smoke. So that's where we were at. So in the late 60s, 69 and then into 70, we have what I call the first stage of the uh, American environmental movement, black smoke. 
things got bad enough that we could taste it, we could smell it. And when that happens in a democracy, people complain and something happens. And what did happen was that the modern environmental movement was born. And we had Earth Day, and the history of that actually started in Madison, Wisconsin, with a group of students at a university sort of like this one who were sitting around talking about how to, how to engage people. And uh, out of that came the first Earth Day about a year later. The other thing that happened is politicians learned to pronounce the word environment. And I say that a little cynically, but because I'm not sure many of them knew what they were talking about, but they at least added it to their speech. When they talked about lowering taxes and, and, and all the other things, they threw in the word and protect our environment. It became part of the, of the, the, the cliche or the soundbite of the stump speech of at least some politicians, the, the more forward-looking ones. And good news, there were some policy decisions that were made. In the early and mid-70s, the Congress of the United States, pushed by people and environmental organizations that were beginning to form, uh, began to pass some regulatory legislation. The Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Environmental Policy Act, all uh, came about uh, during that period of time. And I think one should be honest enough to say, and it's important for me particularly because as you're going to learn, I am uh, somewhat critical of, what, of the progress we've made, but I think it's important to, to state in the beginning that we did make progress in some key areas. And we dealt with the most obvious problems. The first was air pollution. Uh, I'm not sure why uh, in, in the book that I wrote that I've got a custom here, I point out that, that you can live for quite a while without food, a number of days without water, but only a few minutes without air. Now that may be why air pollution is the most obvious. It may also be because you can smell it. Of all of our senses, our, our noses tend to be the best, and so it may be that, that that's why. But air pollution was dealt with probably, and then the next was sewage, the, air, the, the municipal sewage issue. Uh, you may not believe this, but prior to that, there were many cities in this country that dumped basically raw sewage or, or basically filtered sewage. I mean, you put it through a screen, but almost no treatment certainly no secondary and, and not even thought of tertiary treatment. So those things begin to happen, and, and money was spent, and Congress approved money, and President Nixon signed legislation. He vetoed some as well. Congress overrode him on a couple of them. So we, we, we begin to set up a system of, of, of concern and regulatory policy about the environment. And, as I said, progress was made. For example, the Oak Creek Power Plant based on a citizen suit that citizens brought under a, a, a Wisconsin law that was passed that allowed citizens to bring a suit against the polluter that was passed in about 1972. In about 1972 and a half, we brought a lawsuit and forced Oak Creek Power Plant to spend millions of dollars to put on uh, precipitators. The Fox River began to clean up, and lo and behold, fish showed up. So there were, there were, there were things that were happening that were, were very good. However, along towards the early 80s, let's say, we begin to discover, and I say we, I'm sure many people, but I was involved in this actively with people around the country, so we were in touch with each other, and we begin to see it happening generally, and in Wisconsin I experienced it. We learned, much to our surprise, I think many of us, I'm sure there were some academics someplace that think far ahead, uh, but. I was surprised, I must admit, and I think most of us were surprised, that there were much more subtle things that we hadn't thought about that began to raise their ugly heads. For example, the fish in the Fox River could not be eaten. Our Department of Natural Resources had to put out a fish advisory starting in the early 80s, and they still do up to today, warning people not to eat the fish they catch in the Fox River or now Lake Michigan and 80% of Wisconsin in lakes. Wisconsin has many, many lakes. And the warning is don't eat the fish, primarily because of PCBs, because of mercury, because of other heavy metals, et cetera. The, particularly if you're pregnant or if you're young, uh, or certainly not more than, than one meal a week and trim all the fat off first, et cetera. Those are the, that's the standard procedure. So the fish are back, but you can't eat the fish. The Oak Creek Power Plant now puts out white smoke, namely, most of it is water vapor, and that sounds pretty good. But we also learned about something else. We learned about acid rain that you couldn't see. We learned about carbon 
uh, dioxide, which is equal to global warming, that you couldn't see, and suddenly it began to sort of begin to, to uh, coalesce around this real sort of wow. And that's where we moved into what I call the second stage of the modern environmental movement, which uh, is probably around, I'd say, the middle to late 80s. And I call that, just for fun, the it ain't as easy as we thought it was going to be, period. Because what happened is we learned that there were serious systemic problems with how we relate to our environment. And we had dealt with the famous Band-Aids on the cancer, the, the, a filter here, a filter there, but not really de dealing with the systemic problems that were causing these situations to arise. A lot of political rhetoric, an unstable podium, a lot of political rhetoric. We discovered, much to our surprise and, and uh, amazement, some of it, we naive folks who had not been in Washington, that many of the laws that were passed and the congressmen and women rushed home to hold a press conference that I voted for the Clean Water Act, yay, yay, reelect me, this 200-page document, it was designed either accidentally or on purpose, depending on how you want to uh, characterize the particular congressperson in question, with enough loopholes to drive pollution through. And then when the agency, the EPA, had to start writing the regulations, which took years, they had big round tables where the lobbyists got to play. And the average citizen wasn't there, or they were there in a minority role. And Congress was off doing the next crisis, and we discovered that these regulations were very easy to get around, or delay, or procrastinate. And furthermore, I think the basic thing to admit as, as, as citizens in this country who were living through this, we also learned that it wasn't going to be painless. These changes that we needed to make were not going to be as easy as we thought. They were going to involve some major rethinking of how we live. And nobody likes to change. There's a lot of old dogs hanging around. And therefore, the, the people begin to wonder about the changes that were being demanded of them, particularly as we begin to deal with the new environmental issues, which I have made, just made a list of them here. Ozone depletion, certainly acid rain, soil erosion, we begin to learn that we were losing topsoil at you know, tons and tons per acre per year. The, issue, the basic issue of toxics, the we chemists who unthoughtfully, when I was at Columbia University getting my PhD or at Stanford as well, we just poured it down the drain. I mean, we just literally poured the benzene down the drain. And we weren't evil people. We just didn't know any better. That's not done anymore, but it was done then. But not only through that, but through all the pesticides and all the herbicides, et cetera, we have re resulted in a major issue of toxics. The, there's a new book just written by a, a recent Wisconsin uh, graduate called Our Stolen Future that I recommend to you. It's, it's about the, the recent discovery of the effects of some of these chemicals on the endocrine systems of, of our reproduction, primarily in fish and birds at this point, but in people we don't know because we haven't tested it on people other than in sort of a broad societal sense. We haven't done any, any serious you know, laboratory work. So toxics became a major issue. Uh, global warming, the, dis the destruction of habitat, the loss of wetlands, the loss of forest land, the, the issue of extinction. Uh, people are, have written books recently called Extinction, for example. And the, the biggest one of all in terms of what I think is the underlying issue behind all of this in about 1970, a man named Paul Ehrlich wrote a book called The Population Bomb. And it called to our attention the fact that there were an awful lot of people having an awful lot of more people, and that might be a problem. So let's look at what happened. Between 1970, the first Earth Day, and 19, uh, oh, let's, let's go for it, 1997. I'll have to fudge the number a bit because I don't have the new one. The population, when I made a speech in 1970, was 3.8 billion in the world. And it was going up, and that's, more, that's more significant, at about two per second. So every second there were two, I used to go like this, every second, two more people. That's born minus die. Now, 27 years later, 
after all the Earth Days and all the laws and all the awareness and all the posters and all the recycling campaigns, how, have we made progress? Well, we're up to about 5.6-ish billion. And even more scary, we're now at three per second in terms of the global increase. So that's a little bit disheartening. Uh, if you believe, as I do, that population is obviously a key factor in all these issues. Well, around that time, those of us who were active in this, and there were many at this point because we'd had all these Earth Days, and the 1990 Earth Day was a big one that went international. And I think a hundred and some countries took part and many, many people. We began to uh, talk about the need to deal with these other problems. The ozone, the depletion, the population, the, uh, the toxics. And a number of key actors in our society, not only in this country, but in Western Europe at that time, Canada, Japan, the other more industrial countries, the political elites, if you will, begin to realize that dealing with these new environmental problems, as I call them just for conversation, were not going to be quick fixes like the black smoke was. In fact, the big corporations begin to organize and begin to put pressure on politicians not to deal with these issues because they saw that their bottom line, their profit margins, were going to be seriously affected if they had to deal with some of these fairly untractable sort of issues. And individuals begin to be, uh, I guess one should say, influenced by a propaganda machine that was well financed to tell them a whole lot of misinformation, like, and some of these you've heard, if we clean up, we're going to have to lay you off. The famous environmental blackmail, jobs or clean air, take your choice. Of course, we know from the numbers that it's not true. Cleaning up actually produces more jobs than you lose. Some very dirty factories may close, but, but you know, my grandfather worked in a buggy whip factory, and when the auto mill came along, he got laid off. They didn't keep on making buggy whips and pile them up and burn them every week just to keep giving him a job. In a, in a dynamic, dynamic economy, some jobs go and some come. And in the dirty industries, those jobs had to be lost, and many, many more jobs have been created in the pollution control industry and in new tech than in the ones that were lost. The famous case of that, of course, are the, the logging issue in, in the, the Northwest right now, where the timber industry runs around screaming and yelling about all the jobs that are being lost because we're trying to protect the old growth forest. Those, that's total nonsense. There have been loggers who lost their jobs, but it's mostly for other reasons, like they run out of logs or the logs are shipped to Japan and that they aren't putting on the added value they could which is much more labor intensive than the actual whacking down the logs and putting them on ships to get them, out of, to get them across the Pacific. So the, but the jobs issue became a real scare tactic, and it's still being used today, but it was very popular back in, in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. Another issue, of course, is that of, of uh, sort of your, your, the, the lifestyle issue. You know, you, you, uh, the way it was often phrased is, if you listen to those environmental ra radicals, you're going to go back and live in caves and burn candles. They want you to give up your whole life and go back and, and, and live a horrible, cold, uh, miserable lifestyle. And that's what they're talking about, these, these people like Doug LaFalo. So there are all these things begin to, to, to be promoted, talked about, and they were fairly well financed as well. And that began to move us into what I call the third stage of the modern environmental movement, which is the backlash. <coughs> And that's where we are now. We've been in the backlash. These things don't start on January 1. So we've been in it now for four, six, seven years of different levels and different stages, and we still are. What it amounts to is an orchestrated campaign by big business, and they may not like me to say this, but it's well documented where the money comes from, to set up and organize a misinformation campaign. It's funded primarily by oil, by mining, and by timber industry and chemical industries. They're the main contributors to this. They operate under the general name of the wise use movement, but there are many, many different, uh, different names, and I'll mention some of them in a minute. The second thing that they did, again, well-financed, were to set up a whole new bunch of think tanks. 
And these think tanks have lots of interesting names as well. The most famous ones are like the Competitive Institute and the, the Cato Institute, the, the, the Rockford Institute, were well-financed think tanks who were beginning to put out information about how the whole environmental thing was uh, uh, not so serious, don't worry about it, et cetera. And most of these think tanks were very importantly not peer-reviewed. And that's something that I've always resented as someone who, who came up through an academic kind of background, is that when you see these books that come out and these articles that are published by the, the Heritage Foundation or somebody, those articles and books are usually not peer-reviewed. And those biologists and environmental scientists and other people that are working in trying to document the environmental problems that we have go through a very stringent and very critical peer review process. I was just talking with E.O. Wilson about that at lunch yesterday, and he was very concerned about that, and, and just he was almost livid uh, that he spends so much of his time reading peer reviewed work and, and producing some of it as well, and then he picks up some, some article or magazine and sees this absolute BS put out by so-and-so that has never had any review by any, any critical uh, authority. And yet those are the kind of material that gets picked up by the quote media, because it's much easier to quote that than to quote some, some more serious academic work by someone like, like Professor Wilson. The other thing that happened, which is sort of kind of parallel, but I tie it together as an influence, and I think I, I'm right, is it was the rise of talk radio. I mean, talk radio sort of is a fairly new thing. And talk radio was very useful in this backlash, in, 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 uh, in, in uh, bringing the backlash to, to Main Street America. The majority of talk hosts are very conservative. There are very few progressive hosts, and most of them are Rush Limbaugh or worse in terms of, of their philosophy. So talk radio was very helpful in, 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 in getting their message out. And finally, I think we have to be honest about it, human nature plays a role. All of us, including me, I mean, we're human and we tend to, to suffer from certain characteristic traits of our humanness, which made us susceptible to the backlash. And let me just mention a couple of those in, in, in short. If we had a whole semester, we could do a lot with this. One of them is what I call old dogism. I mentioned a minute ago how many old dogs there are around, and a lot of them are 20 years old. You don't need to be 70 to be an old dog. And it became uh, clear that it's easy to play upon people's desire not to change. And the, the people who wanted not to change were, were very successful at doing that. Uh, I could tell lots of stories about it. Uh, let me tell you one that, that prepped me personally. I was a state senator, and I introduced a number of fairly progressive my opponent said radical environmental legislation. Uh, one, for example, require automobiles to get progressively higher gas mileage. Uh, that did become federal law, but then it was scrapped by, by Reagan and continued to be scrapped by Bush and continued to be scrapped by Clinton. I introduced a law requiring uh, 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 windmills to be built on University of Wisconsin experimental farms to make electricity. Uh, this is many years ago, and uh, people laughed, and the Milwaukee Journal ran a picture of me on a horse Tilting windmill, you can imagine that one, how that, how that played. Senator La Follette tilts windmills, wants to build them. But um, I introduced one bill, and none of these bills passed. But one I thought might pass. It was a bill to require energy efficiency standards for new construction. It seemed foolish to me to continue to build new buildings, homes or offices, that leaked energy and didn't use the most efficient technology we had because those will be around for many, many years, allowing us to waste energy and cause pollution. So that bill also didn't get anywhere. But in the Wisconsin legislature, they had a funny thing called Senator's Day, where towards the end of the year, every senator is allowed to pick one bill that he or she really wants to have discussed. No guarantee it's going to pass, but at least get it up to the floor so it can be debated. So I looked through all of my bills and said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be conservative and pick one that's got a chance. So up comes my energy bill. And I won't bore you with the six or seven hours of debate that took place. I couldn't believe it. All kinds of things about how I wanted to ban fireplaces and, and, and shut down society. But we finally got a vote. <laughs> and, and during the vote, uh, every, uh, we still vote by roll call in the state senate. You call the name alphabetically and you, you vote 
uh, yes or no. And a senator may request to explain his or her vote if they wish. You can't debate anymore, but sometimes people can't wait to get the last word, you know, one last little word. So the procedure of the Senate, which is a, a good old boy and now a few girls club, does allow that procedure. So along they go alphabetically voting. And when they get to Senator Bidwell, who was a very elderly conservative Republican senator, he stood up and said, Mr. President, I'd like to explain my vote. Any objection? No objection with unanimous consent. Senator Bidwell stood up and said, Mr. President, I'm going to vote no against my better judgment. He said, now. And that, to me, is so symbolic of the fact that an old dog just couldn't quite accept what was a good idea. I mean, there's nothing you can come up with that's bad about my idea, except that here was a young whippersnapper PhD Democrat doing something, and this guy just couldn't quite see it, so he had to vote no against his better judgment. Well, the other human trait that we have to face, the next one is what I call short-sightedness. We, by the nature of our humanness, don't live a whole long time, and most of us get pretty much involved in the day and day business. Most of you are worried about what you're going to do tonight or tomorrow or your, the paper due on Monday. And that's okay. I mean, he, people, we have to do that. To, and some people think a few weeks and a few months ahead. But most of us live in the pretty short range. Most environmental issues and most of the, of the problems we're not talking about in terms of acid rains and global warmings are things that develop over decades, possibly. And solving them is hard to do at the last minute. And politicians are even more susceptible to this problem because most politicians have to get reborn every two years, reelected. And therefore, they are not likely to do anything or take any positions that cannot bring about a benefit, a good headline, or a, a positive result within a short time, six months or a year. So it's very hard to go up to a politician and convince them to make some sort of a major policy decision or pass a law, particularly one that is not well supported by the financial community that pays the bills for the elections, and tell him or her that it's going to be a really good idea and we'll see that, we'll know that in 10 or 20 years. So short-sightedness is a real problem. And, and related to that is another story I think I should tell that you, you hopefully know already. And that's the, the famous story about the lily pond. How many of you know the lily pond story? The one, one person with a, one or two gray hairs knows it. It's, uh, there was a book written, the title of the book was probably better than the book, I think. It was called The 29th Day. And the story is, 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 is very profound uh, in, in, a, in a very simplistic way. And basically what it says is that there's a lily pond out here in the, in the quad somewhere. And, and it's a very beautiful pond that Harvard undergraduates are very, very uh, lovingly take care of. And one day on the way to class, you notice, you notice it, that there's a brand new plant has come up, a lily you, that you don't know about. And you think, that's interesting, and you go off to class because you're busy. The next day when you walk by, you notice that it's twice as big. And the next day, it's twice as big as again. So you think that you, you had uh, biology and biodiversity class from E.O. Wilson, and he taught you that a monoculture is not a good idea. And, and, and you should be concerned about one species taking over an entire habitat. But you were busy and had to go off to class. The next day, it's, it's d doubled again. And, and you also took mathematics here at Harvard, so you were able to calculate quickly on the back of, a, of, of your notepad that at that rate of doubling, the whole pond would be, abs would be taken over by this new invading lily in, a, in, a, in 30 days. But you're still busy and you have to go off to have a beer or study, probably study. But you swear to yourself that you, upon the oath of, of John Harvard's statue, that I hear is not John Harvard, <laughs> that you will, when that lily covers half the pond, you will stop whatever you're doing and you will deal with it. And you go off. Now the question, and of course this audience knows it immediately, on what day does the lily cover half the pond? The 29th day. Some more naive people might say 15, but you, you would never do that. But that story, as profound and simplistic as it is, is probably one of the biggest hurdles those of us who have tried to get into the policy side of environmental issues. Because by the time a problem is bad enough that you can smell it and taste it, 
by the time the, the, the pond is half full, and you can get the attention of the policymaker, the attention of the public, who then, through our democratic process, will get the attention of the policymaker. Or you can force the polluter, the oil company, or whoever it may be, that maybe what they've been saying is really not true and they do have a problem. All of these things are necessary before you can make change. But that won't happen until it's half full, and then you got one day and it's all over. Things creep up on you in the environmental business, whether it be global warming or acid rain or any of these other issues that we're not dealing with. And that's a real problem. The, the third human characteristic, after old dogism and short-sightedness, is what I call a conflict of interest. Again, pretty obvious, but it happens at, t at different levels. One conflict is, is obviously the jobs conflict. Uh, many people have to go to work every day in an industrial situation that's causing pollution. Or they, they work in a store selling some useless object. But they have to do that to make a living. And if you try to stop that, they're going to be laid off work. Now, I might be able to convince you later on, depending on how much time we have, that um, garbage disposals are bad things. They're basically water pollution machines. You grind up banana peels and, and dump them in the Charles River. Not a very good idea. No self-respecting Harvard student would go out and throw a banana peel in the Charles River, even late at night, I'm sure. But you will put it into a machine and go mix it with three gallons of water, spend a whole bunch of tax money to run it through a treatment plant, a little bit of electricity, and burn a little bit of coal, and then dump it in the Charles River. And that's basically what you're doing. I mean, you put it through a treatment plant and do a little bit to it, but you're still basically putting the due nutrient value, the eutrophication of, of the water in there. So I've convinced you now, right? But it turns out that your father or your uncle or your spouse works in a factory making them. And you can't pay your tuition or, or eat lunch without the money that you're getting. What do you do? It's a conflict. And it's one we all face continuously. Every morning when we get up, we face many of them all day long. And some of the conflicts are obscene in terms of the, the classical conflict of interest between Senator Jones, who owns stock in pol polluting company A, and those we talk about and, and, and we try to make them go away by law and by, and by moral, moral suasion down to the much more subtle and, and complex ones, like the situation of this, of this woman and her, her dependency on garbage disposals to pay her tuition. And they're real. And these conflicts are a problem. Another conflict is the conflict of profit. If you're the owner of a company, even the stockholder of a company, and, and not too closely connected, you are a little bit loath to, to uh, wish that company to spend a lot of money doing environmental control, which may not affect the bottom line in a very positive way, even though it'll be a lot better for the air you breathe. I mean, how do you convince society to what, do what the economists say, internalize external costs? Anybody not know what that means? Internalize external costs? If you don't, you've got to take a course in economics from somebody friend of mine named David, who I just met, maybe you can tell you which, there must be one Harvard professor who understands economics. Most of them don't, I'm sure. <laughs> be, 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 the exhaust pipe of the car inside the car. Yeah, <laughs> because uh, t most classical economists still haven't really caught on to a lot of this environmental stuff. It's too bad. But there are a few that are beginning to understand some of these issues, and the internalization of external costs is important. But it's pretty hard to do. I mean, uh, y y y you've got a couple of factories. These two folks here on the witness stand before the Senate committee, each, each on a factory making widgets. And uh, this fellow here is a real concerned environmentalist who took a course at Harvard on environmental science. So he decided to spend a million dollars and clean up your factory so, you, so you're no longer polluting the Charles River. And your widgets sell for a dollar and ten cents now. But this woman over here who doesn't give a crap about the Charles River who has no environmental conscience, she still makes hers and pollutes the river and sells them for a buck a piece. Now you go down to the store to buy a widget, and there are two widgets laying there, one for a dollar, one for a dollar ten. Which one are you going to buy? No, you don't know. You buy the one for a dollar. Now we put a big sign up. This guy gets real clever, and he hires a PR firm, and he packs his in, in little, little green bags and says, save the Charles, buy my widget. <laughs> and 
Now they cost a dollar and 15 cents because he had to hire a PR person and develop the bag. Now you see them all. Which one are you going to buy? Yeah, you probably will because you're pretty thoughtful. But what will the average consumer do? I think we know. And the case is, is much more complicated than the widgets. And, and uh, this woman has stockholders to, to respond to, and uh, it's very hard. For example, we've tried for years, and I say, when I say we, I don't mean that I just, you know, just society in general, to do things like convince people to buy energy efficient appliances. You can walk into any store in this country now, and you have been able to for at least 10 years, maybe a little more, and, and buy a refrigerator that has a sign on it that tells you how energy efficient it is, and you have a choice of buying that one or one that's less efficient. The better one will cost you $100, $200 more. Simple calculation will show you that over a period of, say, 10 or 15 years, it will be cheaper to buy the more expensive refrigerator because of the saving in electricity. But still, most people who have to deal with a daily budget and a daily pocketbook and are trying to make it on minimum wage or, or, or they've got a kid in college and they, can, they don't have a lot of money. So they buy the cheaper refrigerator or the cheaper light bulb. You buy a light bulb for 79 cents on sale, one of those expensive $12 ones that save a lot of energy, the complex fluorescence. Which do you buy? So it's really difficult, and this is part of the conflict of interest we have. And finally, the, the last conflict of interest issue is the very personal one. I have given talks of this general ilk places, and I often, besides talking about garbage disposals, I often talk about auto air conditioners, another one of those obscene machines that we've decided we can't do without. It's almost impossible in the United States now to buy a new car without air conditioning. You can still buy them in Europe and Japan, although they're moving our direction, thoughtfully. And I'm sure China, as they move their auto industry ahead as full speed as they're trying to do now, are going to want to have air conditioning too. And I've been told by people with a straight face, and these are decent human beings, oh, I couldn't possibly get along without my air conditioner. Because on a summer day, when I was going off to my meeting, if I put the window down, my hair would all blow out of place, and I, could, I, could, I, would, I, would look, I wouldn't look good at my meeting. Or I would pers perspire, and I, my, under my arms would get damp, and, I, and that would be bad. So I've got to have the air conditioner. Well, that's a conflict of interest. What's more important, your hairstyle or global warming? Or ozone layer, in the case of auto air conditioners, that the major cause of C the CFCs that, uh, that, are, that are opening up the ozone hole. Well, how do you vote? How many here would say, down with the air conditioners? <laughs> I see some hesitant hands here. What's wrong? Well, you see where I'm going. Well, what do we do now? I think, and it's worth a few minutes, I think, to stop sort of at this point and do a little sidebar, if you will, because I think that the problem we now face in this backlash period with all these things that I'm sort of bringing up here in, 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 a, in a loose kind of way to come together, there are, they're all related to what I think is a broader subject or they, they fit into of the breakdown of our democracy because Public opinion is still very much for the environment. You see polls all the time that say, you know, 78% say the environment's more important. I'll pay $10 more for my widget to save the environment. I'm willing to, to do, you know, people say that. Now, it's easy to talk. Will they do the walk? Sometimes it's tricky to find out. But public opinion is strongly supportive of the environment. And we live in a democracy. Yet, why does Congress and the President behave the way they behave? We had. Uh, 12 years of absolute idiocy in the presidency on the environment. And now we've had four more years of semi-idiocy. Not as bad as the first 12, but not a whole lot better in many ways. Why do the public let our president and the Congress, the Democratic Congress of many years was so-so, the Republican Congress of the last two years has been a disaster, and they're continuing to do the same kind of things that they tried to do two years ago, but they're being more subtle about it. So wh where's the disconnect? between the public opinion and the, the policymakers. Well, I think it relates to a broader issue of the breakdown of our democracy. So a little quick sidebar about that. There are four areas that I think relate to this dem democracy's demise. One is an organized corporate misinformation campaign that I alluded to earlier. 
and it's intermingled with a general anti-government campaign. Uh, U.S. citizens are fairly susceptible to anti-government stuff. Ever since we, 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 we left the de debtors' prisons of, of England, apparently, and came over here and, and moved west and slaughtered most of what we saw on the way, including fellow human beings, we, we've had this real up by the bootstraps, you know, down with government feeling. Not everybody, but we tend to have a bit more of that than some other societies. So it's easy to, to prey upon that feeling with corporate misinformation about the big bad government in Washington that won't let you build your dream house in that wetland because of the, the hootenanny snail, you know? And it's really easy to, to, to exploit that with misinformation. And these anecdotal stories about the rats that we're preserving that have caused the poor Vietnamese farmer to go bankrupt. You hear that one? I mean, I've got, I, could, I could spend an hour telling you these stories. I, I don't want to do that. There's a, there's a book, actually, that was written by some people that, that, that pokes holes in them. It's called Myth and Consequences. And it goes through about, about 20 or 30 of them and, uh, and tells the, tr the real story of the rats. But the story is there's this poor Vietnamese farmer, and the government descends upon him, locks up his tractor, puts him out of business because there's an endangered rat living in his farm. It turns out to be a kangaroo rat, and in fact it is endangered. And this farmer is a multi-millionaire farmer, and he's been warned three times that he cannot plow this one little three-acre section of his 100-acre ranch in California. But he continues to try to plow it, and the government did come in and stop him. But Congressman Jones on the floor of the US Congress is ranting and raving about these environmental wackos, a word he learned from Rush Limbaugh, that are stopping society all because of some damn rat. And of course, the, then this makes Reader's Digest, and it makes Paul Harvey, and before long, everybody's going like this about those environmentalists. And I could tell you many, many stories like that, but I won't because of time. So then we have the wise use movement and, and all, of the, all of their power, and, um, and all these different groups. And I, I can't resist telling you about, about one, of the, one that's fairly new that, that I, uh, I couldn't, I chuckled over. I told you about some of them earlier. The Heritage Foundation, the Competitive Institute, all of these, these groups that are out promoting anti-environmentalists with a lot of budget. But here's one that sprung up uh, about a year ago. It's called Northwesterners for More Fish. It's the name of the group. They're out in Washington, Oregon. And it uh, sounds real good, right? Well, it turns out that it is, it is a, a new organization funded by the timber industry and the utility industry both of whom don't want to save the salmon, because saving the salmon, which is extinct, and, not extinct, which is endangered and, and, and in great trouble in the Pacific Northwest rivers because of the siltation from clear cutting and because of the dams for hydroelectric. So this group called Northwesterners for More Fish is a, an example of what some of us have called green scamming. And they're out attacking the environmental movement who wants to save the salmon. And there's many of these. So there's the Friends of the Eagle Mountain, the National Wetland Coalition, California for Balanced Wildlife uh, Management, and on and on. There are dozens of these groups. The National Wilderness Institute, the American Environmental Foundation, the Abundant Wildlife Society of North America, the Global, Cli the Global Climate Coalition. These are all industry-funded groups that are promoting anti-environmental messages. And just to, to put the icing on the cake, the Northwesterners for More Fish, the first year, their budget, the amount of money they were given for their budget the first year was $2.6 million. What environmental group that you've ever been associated would give their eye teeth to have a budget of, of half that in their first year of trying to organize the Cambridge citizens for cleaner air, or whatever group that you've been involved in, that the struggle having bake sales to raise a few pennies to try to get their message out? Well, I, I talked about the issue of, of jobs versus the environment. Let me give you another example of, of this. Um, here's a great publication for Earth Day, 1976. This is now a year old. I don't have any new ones, I apologize. I have about uh, 600 of these in my office in, in boxes. A year, a year and two months ago, I got a fax. And it came to dear public official. So it was generic which means a lot of them went out, because I'm nobody special. I'm just the Secretary of State of Wisconsin. They went out to state senators, state legislators, sections of state governors, all over the country. And it said, we are preparing a great Earth Day handout for you to give out on Earth Day, 
which would have been a year ago now, when you give speeches, which you probably do because you're a, quote, public official. How many would you like? Well, I read who it came from, and I knew, so I checked 1,000 and sent it back. And lo and behold, they arrived about a month later, 1,000 of these wonderful documents, which I refuse to hand out, other than to someone like you who I tell you about. It's very good. It's very slick. And there are some people who have PhD after their names who wrote them. And this is put out by the Heartland Foundation, a very right-wing anti-environmental group, and they provided over a million of these to people who wanted to give them out free of charge in audiences where they were speaking around the country. So I brought along a couple of them. I'll give one to you symbolically for you to read, and then maybe we can put one in your environmental library or somewhere. I gave one to E.O. Wilson, who couldn't wait to read it. He said, oh, because he was talking about this. I happened to have him. I brought three with me. So I reached in my briefcase and said, well, you won't believe this. And he looked at it. It took me, it took me about two minutes, because he thought it was good. He thought it was a good thing at first. I didn't tell him. And then he worked his way down here. And then he opened it up, and he saw one of the authors who he knew, one of the famous. And you know what he, can I quote Wilson publicly? I might get in trouble. <laughs> what he said is, ah, one of the environmental prostitutes. <laughs> because that's what he and I call some of these academics who get big bucks from, from the industry, who then, uh, write articles saying how global warming doesn't exist. <clears throat> okay, so, so that's the first thing that's causing a breakdown of our democracy. A well-financed misinformation campaign that's confusing the public. It really is confusing the public. There's no question about it. And I've got other examples here that I won't bother with because of time. Well, the, the, the second problem which ties into that is the public generally is not well-informed. They're very busy. Most people are very busy making a living, raising their kids, being sick, getting well, looking for a new job, getting through school, working at a part-time job. All that is, is very time consuming. If you talk to most Americans, they, they lack any free time. And most all of their information now comes from a little bit of TV news or a little bit of radio talk. talk, talk. I mean, no one, I shouldn't say no one, Vast majority of people do not read any newspaper, or if they do, it's only the headline, the sports page, or something like that. I mean, really, people are not getting information from any good sources, let alone anything serious. And because of that, we have a public that's not well informed and very susceptible to the first thing I talked about. And these environmental issues are very complicated. And making decisions about our garbage disposals and our air conditioners and other things our population are going to be, are going to require informed, thoughtful people who are willing to sit down and reason together, to use an old cliche that hopefully people used to think about doing. No one sits down and reasons together anymore. And I think as an offshoot of that, our public officials don't even try hardly. I mean, there was a time that I can still remember when legislative bodies, including our U.S. Senate, despite their partisan nature, and despite some contentious issues, did try to reason together. You may have read about some of this. I mean, they, they used to get together. Uh, I mean, Tip O'Neill used to have them over to his office, and they'd pull out the scotch or something. And the Republican Democrats would actually talk to each other in a social context. And that, that led to a civility. And I'm sure you all heard enough about the uncivility of our current public institutions. Uh, it's become a, a recent op-ed thing to do. But, but it's true. So you, you've got this situation that, that, that is working its way from the public up to the public officials that's, that's leading to a breakdown of the democratic process as well. The third thing I want to talk about in this regard is the cost of campaigns. Big money is now taking over government. This was said by someone many years ago, and they were sort of bemoaning what's happening, and now it's, it's very, very true. We have the best money government can buy. If I'd have given this talk, say, two years ago, I might have had to tell you about it. What's happened in the last round of elections has been so obscene that even a sequestered Harvard student who's taking a heavy load and a TA has probably heard about it. So I'm not going to try to, to, to tell you about that particular issue, other than to tell you that if you look at the numbers, and I've got them all here in, 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 in reports of, of who, where the money comes from and which committee chairman and chairwomen women get the money, we have, the polluting industries have bought and paid for everybody they can, and they bought and paid for a lot on both sides of the aisle. And we've also reached a point where the average citizen can no longer run for public office. 
and I tell that to you, that no one in this room, including me, will have a, a Tinker's Dam's chance of getting elected to high office. By that I mean governor, U.S. Senate, or Congress. And, and many state legislators now, like California and maybe Massachusetts, where the price tag's going up. Unless you happen to be a millionaire, or unless you're willing to sell out to the public, to the big interest groups, to raise the, 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 the PAC money that, you, that it takes. It's millions and millions of dollars. And it is basically killing, or, or has, has killed, our democratic process. It's a very serious charge I make, but it's one that I do uh, with, with careful thought, and, and having seen it vis-a-vis -vis the environmental situation, and experienced it myself. Am I a little bit bitter about it? Well, I think I've gotten over it. But I've, I've run for higher office twice in my life, and been outspent 50 to 1 each time, and been, uh, and been defeated each time by a few votes, uh, by tremendous amounts of money, four, five, six million dollars, up against my 20,000 in a race for U.S. Senate, for example. And of course, the corporate lobbyists who are responsible for most of the money represent the anti-environmental movement. There was a case that was so bizarre about two years ago, a year and a half ago, where it was documented and became a public scandal that some of the Republican committee chairmen were inviting the lobbyists into their offices to actually write the legislation. And the way it became public is someone was asking about introducing the bill. And this, the, the Republican chairman of the committee said, I can't introduce this bill yet. I haven't read it. I have to wait till I have time to look at it, and then they discovered who wrote it, and it was written by the, by the lobbyists for the polluting industry. That was a, a public scandal in Washington. And of course, finally, I think we have to be honest again about the way we live. The fourth factor that I think has led to the demise of our democracy, and therefore has exacerbated terrifically our ability to deal with these serious environmental problems, the global warmings, the acid rains that I talked about, and have therefore led to this backlash situation where we're sort of at a standstill, unfortunately, because the problems are continuing to go up, the population is continuing to go up, the rest of the world is about to industrialize. Imagine tomorrow morning if you woke up and every Chinese and Indian and Brazilian and Venezuelan and South African had as many garbage disposals and air-conditioned cars and VCRs as the average American. The earth would probably just go and yet, they're doing it, and it's pretty hard to tell them why they should not do it when we are doing it. So the fourth factor is what I call a loss of community. We no longer live in communities. One thing that I found quite nice about being here in Harvard, and Tom took me on a, on a tour and talked to me a little bit about how you folks live here, and assuming he told a pretty good story about how, the truth of it, uh, you live in a community. I mean, the Harvard undergraduate community is a community. And you live together, you eat together, and hopefully you talk to each other about some things that are serious occasionally. Well, well, that, well that is missing now in most of, the, of, the, of this country. We live in anonymous communities, anonymous condos, where we either don't know or are afraid of our neighbors. And that does not lead to problem solving about societal problems that are so significant and are going to involve sacrifice and good information, which I've hopefully convinced you are required to deal with these environmental problems. So the loss of community is, is, is important. People get all their information from a little bit of TV. Uh, the individualism, which we're famous for, and a little bit of it goes a long ways in terms of this issue. Are we willing to make personal sacrifices for the sake of the community? Is the community more important than the individual? And when it comes to environmental issues, the answer is it has to be, because saving the environment is a communal issue versus the individual who wants to get rid of the banana peel or the person who wants their hair to stay proper in the air-conditioned car. So this conflict between the individual and the community, when you lose the community, becomes a lost cause to some extent. Particularly when our elected officials, as I've indicated, no longer represent the community the way they theoretically should in a, in a representative democracy like we have. They don't represent the community anymore. They don't even go talk to the community. They don't even go raise money in the community. When I first ran for office, we had spaghetti dinners, and we charged 10 bucks, or what you could afford. And we got 100 people, and we raised money that way. And I had to talk to those people for two hours, you know, while they came and ate spaghetti and, and gave me $10. Now, 
Politicians don't even bother to have the spaghetti dinners. Why bother? You get on the phone and, make, and you get $10,000 at a crack. So, the, so not only is the community dissolved, but the people who are supposed to represent the community no longer even pretend, other than in, a, in some sort of a, of a slick kind of commercial or, or soundbite, to represent the community. Well, that can be represented by another story that I won't tell, I hope, because you all heard it. How many of you do not know the story of the tragedy of the commons, the story by uh, Garrett Hardin, biologist in California? How many have not heard that story? Oh, really? Oh, shucks. OK, I got to do it then. Uh, Garrett Hardin, a biologist in California, many years ago wrote a little, little, a little environmental essay called The Tragedy of the Commons. And the story he tells, uh, I could try to make it into the Harvard Commons. You have a commons here probably, don't you? But, uh, but that would take more thinking than I have able to do and also hurry. So I'll tell the story the way Garrett Hardin wrote it. In England, you've got a common piece of green. And around that piece of green, you've got a number of people who are living. And those people have a cow. Every family has a cow, and they milk the cow, they drink the milk. And things work very fine, and the cows spend all day long on the commons. Pretty, pretty true situation. Well, one, one entrepreneurial family decided, for some unknown reason, that they were going to get a, two cows. So they got two cows, and they had twice as much milk, and they were doing very well. The neighbors said, wait a minute, and had three cows. And before long, people had five, six, seven, eight cows, and the commons died. There were too many cows. It could not support the cows. The grass died. The cows died. There was no milk. The things collapsed. That is the tragedy of the commons. Now, if I was an eco a professor of economics, and this was, a, was a, a, a graduate course in economics, I could tell the same story very complicatedly, and I might not even understand what I'm talking about, but it basically is back to the issue of the internalization of external costs. If this woman can dump her garbage in our river and sell widgets cheaper, then she is basically taking advantage of the tragedy of the commons, the common river, the common air, the common land. And that, is that very simple essay, which even sounds trivial when I tell it, is I think combined with the lily pond story of the, of the 29th day, two of the most profound things ever related to the environmental issue. And the two together, I think, tell the whole story of the, the mess we're currently in. So when you lose the commons and, and when you don't have the community, that's a problem. Well, where are we at now? Let's talk about politics just for a few minutes. I can get away with doing that, I guess, uh, at this forum. Uh, I don't see a whole lot to be optimistic about. And I'm not going to dwell on it, because you people probably follow it pretty well. Uh, certainly, in the, the last uh, couple of elections, we've had almost no discussion of the environment. The, the last time I did a, a, a study of this, you know, where I actually bothered to kind of look up numbers, was in the, the, uh, the presidential primary, where there were a whole lot of, of Republican candidates running, so you, uh, so you could look at them. And there, there, there were, was, was uh, Luger and Forbes and Dole and uh, a whole lot of them. So you could, you could keep track of all their speeches, and, and you could watch their TV debates and see who mentioned it. There was not more than twice that environment was mentioned in all those Republican debates for president, which I thought was just amazing. And some of the things that were said were amazing. And I've got some quotes here from some of the candidates like Forbes and Luger that were pretty amazing. But, uh, and, and, and of course, most people didn't even try to mention the word environment. So in a major contest for the presidential uh, nominee for the Republican Party, environment played basically zero role. And Clinton didn't do a whole lot better until he sort of caught on. Uh, I can't claim credit for this, probably, but uh, I, I got invited to the White House one time a couple years ago. And I got to meet the president for that standard you know, two minutes you get to meet a president, unless you gave a lot more money than I, I contribute. I didn't get to stay in the Lincoln bedroom. But uh, I, was, I was in the, uh, the, the Roosevelt room for about 20 minutes. <laughs> and uh, I said to him, uh, quite honestly, I said, Mr. President, you're not talking about the environment enough. You should, for two reasons. It's important to save society, but it's good for you politically. People care about it, and you ought to start talking about it. Well, about, about nine months later, he did. I don't think I had to do it. I think he had better pollsters than me telling him that environment was something that people cared about. So if you noticed, in the re-election campaign for president, his, his standard stump speech talked about blip, blip, education, blip, tax cuts, and the environment. 
that, that became a throwaway word along with, with the rest of them. So I'm not very sanguine about that either. And uh, everyone thought that Gore was going to be the great environmental vice president. But of course, vice presidents don't get to do anything but do what the presidents tell them to do. And now Gore's running for president. So he's already you know, compromising as quick as possible on these issues as well. <laughs> because he knows who pays the piper. And who pays the piper calls the tune. And that's the unfortunate thing that I've conveyed to you in what hopefully is not the most depressing forum speech in Harvard history. <laughs> so what do we do about it? How do we mobilize this, this incipient public opinion? How do we educate people? How do, how do we influence our political system? I wish I knew. I had dinner last night with a group of students. and. Uh, that they were kind of done eating, and I hadn't eaten yet, so, so I could eat and make them talk. I asked them the question. I turned tables around and said, you know, what do you think? You know, how can we do this? And uh, they didn't have a lot of answers, but I, 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 well, I'm not critical of that, because I don't either. I've reached a point where if I'd have given this talk 27 years ago in 1970, and I did talks that weren't the same topic, but the same general idea of our environment, I had a whole list of things to do. You know, elect better people, pass good laws, have, have posters, set up recycling centers, have environmental education programs. Uh, environmental education programs is a great example. We, we've passed laws in some states like Wisconsin to require environmental education in the schools. But a study done by the University of Stevens Point environmental people just last year in Wisconsin showed that it's not happening. The teachers don't understand it. They're afraid of it. The school boards think it's a communist plot, so they're against it. And just recently, there's been a lot of stuff come out. A new book has just been written for parents to, to, called, um, oh, what's the name of it? Do you remember? I showed it to you. Anyways, uh, it's a book that's come out by, <laughs> by um, it's called Facts or F Fiction, The Truths to Tell Your Kids About the Environment. And, and it's just awful propaganda to counter this, this left-wing environmental education that we have forced upon the students where students go home and tell their parents, Daddy, you're, you're hurting the environment with that garbage disposal. Or Mommy, you shouldn't have the air conditioner on. And, and the, these, these, these radical kids that have been, been brainwashed by their teachers, the very few that are doing it, and there's some, some probably are trying, are go home and upsetting their parents. So their parents are going to school boards and all this going on. So what are we going to do with all this? Who knows? Folks say that the pendulum swings. And it's true. And we have now swung a long ways towards an anti-environmental direction. I'm not sure whether it's left or right or not. I reject the idea that I'm a, quote, liberal, which people often call me. I am a real conservative. And I had a real good uh, discussion with E.O. Wilson about that, who also likes to think of himself as a conservative. Because we are two conservatives. We want to conserve the air and the water and the environment. It's a bunch of those radical industrialists who want to release all the chemicals and all the pollution, who want to think about the bottom line tomorrow and forget about 20 years. So I think it's time we turn it around and we become the root to true conservatives and paint the, the, the anti-environmentalists as the extremists and the radicals. And to some extent, the Congress, about a year or so ago, begin to get painted in that corner. And they, they begin to sort of backpedal and come up with better PR and actually one group put out a, a, a candidate's guide. This is how to run for office uh, and, and be, sound like you're for the environment. It's a wonderful thing. So it tells someone like, like Newt Gingrich or, or even worse than him, uh, Congressman Young. I mean, no, Congressman Young from Alaska. I mean, the, the true answer to environmental stupidity. I mean, he's awful. Uh, so this teaches them how to give a campaign speech that makes them sound like they're for the environment. And this is given out by these groups again as well. Here's a quote for you I had to bring along from Don Young, congressman from Alaska. So those of us who knew Don Young and didn't love him used to make fun and poke fun because he was elected in Alaska year after year after year. But he was sort of harmless because the Democrats controlled the Congress. Now, that doesn't mean Democrats are all good, but at least Don Young was a minority member. Well, two years ago, when the Republicans took over, Don Young became the chairman of the Environment Committee of the House of Representatives, because he had seniority. The same way Senator Mikowski of Alaska, who's almost as jerky as Young, became chairman of the Senate Environment Committee. 
Well, it, that's awful. It's just unbelievable. But here's his quote. Don Young, chairman of the Environment Committee in the House of Representatives of the United States of America. Environmentalists are, quote, waffle stomping, Harvard graduating, intellectual bunch of idiots. <laughs> Thought you'd appreciate that. We got a real problem on our hands, and what are we going to do about it? I think this pendulum issue is true, and I think the pendulum is over this way pretty far, and I think it will come back. But I am nervous, and I was interviewed by a, a, a radio news person after a talk like this a few years ago, and she came up to me with her microphone, and I think she was pretty new, and she was nervous, and uh, she, 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 she wanted something uh, for a little, for uh, one minute news, she said, Secretary La Follette, I've heard all this, and I want to know, are you an optimist or a pessimist? I thought for a minute, and I said, well, I'm sort of a, a desperate optimist. And I guess that's about the best thing I can still be. I wouldn't be here doing what I'm doing if I wasn't optimistic. But I'm pretty desperate now. And the trouble with the pendulum is the 29th day, and the fact that it's hard to go backwards when you've done certain things wrong. And let me finish with one story about that in terms of extinction. I've fought this battle many times, and some of you have, and some of you will. But there's a 100-acre there's a piece of beautiful land right outside of Cambridge somewhere. And it's woods, and it's nice, and there are frogs live there. And a, a developer wants to come and uh, put in a subdevelopment, 100 acres of shopping centers and, and, and condominiums. And we fight against it. And Tom forms the Save, Save the Frog Committee. And we have a cookie, a cookie sale, and we, we raise $100, and we, we're working hard, we put up posters. And finally, after months of fighting and hiring lawyers or getting volunteer lawyers, we settle on a compromise. And they're allowed to build a 50-acre subdevelopment, and we get to save 50 acres of woods and swamps. That's a disaster. Compromise which we are taught from the time we're two years old. Remember when you were two years old and it was time to go get an ice cream cone and you and your brother got in the back of the car, you only had one brother because your family believed in two children because they understand the problem of the environment, and you're off to the ice cream store and you start fighting over whether you're going to buy chocolate or vanilla. And your mother says, sit down, sit down, we'll compromise, we'll get Neapolitan, and you're both happy, you know. And it's true, to get along in the world around us without bumping elbows over everyday life Compromise is a very useful human characteristic. But when it comes to environmental issues, it becomes a disaster. So it's another disconnect between how we live and how we're taught as individuals and how our attitudes reflect the environment. Because what happens? Two years later, there's a brand new proposal to build a new development in the 50-acre marsh that is still left. Sound familiar? I've gone through that. And if you're ever talking to a, 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 small, a class of small children, you can, you can tell the story a similar way about, about the endangered eagle, the, the American symbol. And uh, it became endangered, and there were only a few eagles left, and Congress talked about it. And finally, it got so bad that there were only two eagles left, a male and a female. And after much, much arguing, the U.S. Senate voted under the leadership of Senator Mikowski in Alaska to save one of the eagles. <laughs> well, I don't have the answers. I'd like to hear from you, and I will try to respond to your questions. I won't, I won't answer them for sure, but I'll try to respond to them. But I'd also like to hear your thoughts and your ideas in the next uh, 20, 30 minutes, whatever we have. Uh, I'll be here for a while. I'll also be around tomorrow for Earth Day. I'm staying for your Earth Day event, and Tom's going to tell you where that is. It's going to be indoors, probably, because we're getting lots of good April showers for those May flowers. But, uh, but I'll be around to do that, and I'll be around here a little bit as well. And I, I really want to thank you for your attention and for allowing me to come here and, uh, and share some of my thoughts about the last 27 years of going from the black smoke uh, to the backlash. Thank you very much. <laughs> do you want to come up here now? Is, is that the plan? Oh, I, I forgot to mention this. I brought along some of the books that I wrote. It's called The Survival Handbook. It is not, it's not an academic book. It's a how to, how to raise heck book. Uh, and it has chapters on air, water, endangered species, population, how to organize, how to write a press release. And I brought some along. Uh, if you want to have one, we'll, 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 I've got a hat here. We can pull the donation. The money goes to an environmental group back home in Wisconsin. And, and
and they sell from anywhere from five dollars to a thousand dollars. The cover price is ten, and help yourself if you want one. Thank you for reminding me. No problem. Okay, so uh, you can come up after the after the question and answer period and buy one of the books. The Earth Day tomorrow. Uh, this talk was co-sponsored by the Institute of Politics and the Environmental Action Committee. And we found out that definitely the Earth Day will be indoors uh, due to the weather. So if a lot of people I see here aren't undergraduates, so um, if anyone knows where the Winthrop House is, John Winthrop House, it's on Mill Street uh, along the Charles River. It's going to be in the Winthrop House JCR, the Junior Common Room. Uh, it, that's in Gore, the Gore building of Winthrop House. Uh, and that'll start at 12, 12 o'clock uh, noon and go until about 5. We have six student bands coming. There'll be a lot of tabling by environmentalist uh, organizations on campus and in Boston, and uh, Dr. La Follette will be walking around to answer questions, sell his book, and talk to people about the environment. So now we have about 20 minutes to ask questions. <laughs> I'm a chemical engineer and I see almost in manufacturing and I see almost everything differently than you do. Uh, but I wondered if you really understand why technologists in, in manufacturing see things the way they do. And let me give you an example. Uh, you've heard of the Boston Harbor cleanup, I presume. Yes, right. 1970, that was one of the first issues in environmental issues in Boston, and it was going to make Boston Harbor clean. As a result, the bureaucrats had to implement restrictions on industrial discharge into the sewer system, which would not interfere with the very delicate secondary treatment, which involves bacteria and so on. Uh, and that included zero cyanide. And if you know anything about discharge of cyanide, it decomposes by itself in the sewer pipes. It's not a, uh, a, a cumulative problem like mercury would be, for example. They had what I would consider irrational uh, regulation. Uh, and draconian enforcement. I mean, when, they, when you criticize them for their regulation, they right away can selectively enforce against you. So I have been ex I'm quite experienced with the tactics. Anyway, as a result of 27 years of Boston Harbor cleanup, we have an $8 billion project, which isn't going to make Boston Harbor clean. They can no longer afford to clean up the Charles River, which was going to be part of the project, because they're spending money on a nine-mile nine discharge pipe, all pretending to make Boston Harbor clean. The, the sewer rates are now higher than the real estate rates, or they soon, the tax, they soon will be. Uh, they can't afford to protect the drinking water supply, which comes from, uh, they can't afford to make the latest improvements in, in it. How do you respond to the fact that uh, we have here unfulfillable public expectations, uh, irrational regulations, which industry is held responsible for, but can't comply with. And, and I should point out also that half the manufacturing jobs in the Boston area have moved out of the Boston area. And I can personally tell you from personal experience that I know in some of those cases, my companies have in fact moved out of the Boston area because you could not deal with these irrational people. Uh, I appreciate that, and, and, and I, don't, I don't make light of, of the gentleman's points. My, my biggest problem is that I could probably put together an answer that would take somewhere in the 20 or 30 minutes, really, because you, you raise a lot of points that, that are, are good points. I don't agree with you necessarily about conclusions, but your points are valid, and all of them deserve some attention. I'm kind of at a, at a loss how to handle that given the time. I guess the, my, my quick and not meant to be flippant, but it'll sound flippant answer, is you've given a great example of society gone amok. I mean, human nature screws up things, and this is screwed up. That doesn't mean that the harbor shouldn't have been cleaned up. I presume you, you, you think the harbor should have been cleaned up. No. It shouldn't have been. So the harbor should have been left dirty. Well, here, there's where we don't agree. Right. in the pri primary treatment system should never have been discharged into the harbor. For $90 million, they ended that. That should have been done 50 okay. years ago or 100 years so, ago. So, so you agree the harbor should have been cleaned up? No, it should have been. That should have been ended. You can't make the harbor clean. In fact, believe it or not, I mean, I've talked, obviously you can see I'm quite interested in this issue, even though I'm not an academic. I've spoken with marine biologists who point out that there is evidence that once you clean the water column, which is all they're doing, 
you, you realize there's three, there's two million tons of sludge at the bottom of the harbor, which has been accumulating for centuries. Once you clean up the water column, column the activity in the harbor, worms and whatever all these uh, organisms are that live in that sludge, will thrive. They will churn up the sludge, and you will now resuspend sediments like mercury, cadmium, PCBs maybe, that have been dormant for decades. So in fact, there are some who would argue, and there's some experimental evidence. They have modeled, they've built experimental yeah. in the laboratories We've samples of clean water columns and dirty water columns. You actually end up with a with hazardous, a more hazardous we were probably like at Wisconsin in, 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 in Fox River Green Bay with PCBs in the sludge there. And I'm and, suggesting that academics and, and politicians may not have the expertise, and I'm not saying that business people are, 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 are the best motivated people, but they may be the only ones with the competence. Well, some of them may have the competence, but I think, I mean, this again would take a long time, and, and, and I don't want to make light of his concern, but I do think that his conclusion is wrong. Namely, one shouldn't have tried to clean the harbor up. I think that there are many environmental problems that we've tried to deal with, and I think I alluded to a little bit about how the regulations sometimes got caught up in bureaucracy and red tape in Washington, and, and the industry rushes in, and, and a lot of misinformation. A lot of these industries that may know how to do it may not want to do it, and they're not above deceit and deception. Not all of them, but some of them. And academics can be wrong, and the public can be misled. So all of us sort of screwing up together can make real messes. I think the Democratic Congress, and I say Democratic because this happened when they were in charge in the 70s and 80s, did a lousy job of oversight. And if there was a case where a law was passed dealing with cyanide, for use your example, when cyanide wasn't a problem, which it may not have been, and I, I'll take your word for it, but chromium was, and I know chromium in, in Racine, Wisconsin, chromium killed our sewer plant because chromium does kill bacteria and it was coming out of an American brass and plating company. So maybe we should have been damn tough on chromium and said forget cyanide. But that requires a lot of thoughtful working together. And historically, people have not done that. Industry drew up their wagons and, and the other side drew up their wagons and we didn't have that sitting down reasoning together. And the Congress, when they passed the Clean Water Acts or anything else, didn't have the oversight to say, wait a minute, let's fix the cyanide thing, we made a mistake but let's be tough on the chromium. And th that kind of oversight has been missing for 20 some years. And that has led to horror stories of the Boston Harbor type, which make it easy, I don't accuse you of this, but maybe a little bit, of, of a horror story presentation to make fun of environmental regulation, which basically is a good thing to do, but the problem is how do you do it right? And I could go on with lots of your points for a long time, but I want to give up people a chance. So I hope that helps a little bit with kind of how I feel about you, what you've said. Yeah, if we can just keep the questions a little shorter so that more people could get to ask questions. We only have about 15 more minutes left. Does anyone else have? Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and go, go to the microphone and be next. You can walk up there and, and, and exercise. You'll be uh, next after this man. Yeah. Because I, uh, I agree uh, with so much of what you, you've said, I'd be interested to hear what you may have to say about the role that some of the major so-called environmental organizations that are not of the kind that you described have the role that they have uh, played in the setbacks to the environmental movement. Uh, there have been some of the best writing on this that I've encountered has been by Alexander Coburn uh, together with a guy by the name of Jeff Jeffrey St. Clair. I've read both authors, yeah. And uh, so if you could maybe <coughs> give your view yeah. of, of this. Do I need to explain the question or not? I don't know how sanguine you are. What, what he's pointing out is a big issue that's been bouncing around for, oh, half a decade or more now. The, the strong statement would be the, the, big, the big time environmental groups have sold out in Washington and become ultimate compromisers, Audubon, Sierra Club, et cetera. They're more interested in getting a law passed than getting a good law passed. And they have sort of, there's been a, a, a disconnect between them and the local grassroots at the toxic waste site, at the incinerator type groups that are trying to do things locally. And uh, many of the big time environmental groups have executive directors who make, you know, $200,000 salaries and drive around in Mercedes Benz and uh, all the kind of things that you can imagine goes on about that. What do I think about that quote problem? Well, I don't know. Uh, I guess human beings are in charge. That's the problem. 
and human beings have, a, have, some, have some, some weaknesses. And environmental leaders are no better or worse in that regard than the industrial leaders or the political leaders. Uh, hopefully, they're motivated uh, in, in a, what I think is a more positive way because they're not normally trying to get rich, although some of the big salaries were criticized uh, in, in a few cases. I think there's some truth in the charge, but I think that you need both. You need a more establishment group in Washington to work with that group of establishment lunatics called the Congress. I mean, and they're there, and I have friends that have been there for five, ten, one guy almost 20 years now as a lobbyist working for, the, uh, for different groups that I, that I have friends working. And it's, it's a hellish job to be on the Hill day after day trying to deal with this. But that's probably worthwhile. You also need the grassroots group. You need the groups like Lois Gibbs and her groups, the, the, the Citizens Clearinghouse for Hazardous Waste that works at the local level. So I guess rather than, than do what some of the authors have done of condemning them so strongly, I would say take them for what they are, know what they are, send them your $20 because they, they're probably doing, doing better than not doing anything, but also send $20 to, to the local group and join up and help them. I think we need all of these perspectives and we need less uh, division among ourselves as we do coalition. The other side is good at coalition. The people that get together to, to fund the, uh, the Northwesterners for more fish and raise $2.6 million in one year, they know how to work together. We need to learn how to work together better, I think, if we're going to be successful at, at accomplishing things and at dealing with the kind of problems that the other gentleman raised of, of doing it right rather than doing it the way we the way we're headed and not being self-critical enough. I don't want to talk too much longer. Yeah. Hi. My name is Rucker Alex. I'm an undergraduate um, here. Um, I'm particularly interested in the tie between politics and the environmental movement um, and s was struck by two factors kind of inherent in the environmental movement that you mentioned. One is the loss of community um, and the other is that the envir environmentalism is, is um, it, it's not or it is a uh, a, a long-sighted uh, kind of movement that you, you need to be able to, to kind of see the big picture. And a lot of people, particularly politicians, because they're operating on two-year two terms, um, are not able to, to do that. Um, I was wondering, um, and this is something that you were just talking about, um, about um, what you think about grassroots uh, political action slash environmental action movements um, because they, they would seem to me to be particularly effective because uh, people can kind of get ownership, local you know, communities can take ownership over yeah. uh, environmental issues and really work toward, toward maybe in the short term, um, seeing a change. And if, if those uh, local movements are effective, then what does that mean for national um, environmental movements? Um, is it possible to, to you know, get all the factors uh, working together on a national level? Well, I hope so, because I mean, I sort of semi-answered your question in responding exactly. to the gentleman back there. Uh, I am a very strong supporter in the grassroots approach. In fact, there's a, in this book, the most important chapter in this book is chapter 13, if I remember it right. Authors should remember to know chapter, shouldn't they? Uh, 13, Ecology in the Political Arena where I talk about how to write a press release, how to hold a press conference, you know, I mean, the stuff that citizens are intimidated by. So I think the grassroots groups are essential for two reasons. They tend to be on the, on the scene and understand the issue. And second of all, they are the only ones who can convert their concerns to real political muscle because despite all the millions of dollars of bullshit TV ads that the politicians are running, they still have to get people to vote for them. And a good grassroots activity can get votes and can have an impact. It's hard when people are, are not listening, but it's the only hope we have. At the same time, the national groups can provide the ammunition. I subscribe uh, by mail and by email to at least a dozen na big national groups, and I read it very carefully. They're Washington newsletters, and they're Washington emails that come out every day or every week. Uh, so I, keep, I know what's going on with, with Senator Craig's uh, Improve the Forest Bill, which is a disaster for American forests. But it's called the Bill by Senator Craig. And I, and I know about that. I wouldn't know about that if I was a grassroots group without, without a computer to, to connect email to the, uh, the National Resource Defense Council's uh, monthly updates, et cetera. So you need both. And the hardest thing for me to say is that I'm, I'm, I'm not very sanguine about the American public's willingness to give of themselves 
of the time to make these things happen because they're so overburdened. Remember I told you people are busy and they're uninformed and they're trying to make a living and take care of sick kids and single parents and two income families. All those things we know about that have caused the other societal and cultural crises that we hear a lot about play into the environmental problem as well, as you, as you see. I, I also have two other articles I brought along I forgot to mention. Uh, one about some of the stuff that Germany has tried to do with some success to point out that you can have a good economy and, and good environment. And another one that is uh, particularly interesting, it talks about how the issue of, of male femaleism plays into this role. And is the fact that the people in charge are mostly men a problem? I think it may, have a, it may be a problem because it turns out, it's a great article, it points out that, that leaders are somehow able to rise to the occasion, spend billions of dollars to fight a semi-mythical problem like communism. Literally, your parents bankrupt your generation, totally bankrupt your generation, building nuclear weapons to fight communism, which was a potential and not very serious threat. And it turned out to be no threat at all. And yet, you mentioned global warming, and those same male leaders won't spend a penny to fight it. Why is it that some, some challenges get the male eagle ready to go out and do battle, and some, they poo-poo? And, and if you had women in charge, would they be more interested in global warming than fighting communism? Who knows? Uh, I'm going to make sure you get one of each of these so that if people want them and, and there aren't enough of them, uh, you can. OK, we're them also them. We're, uh, we're already running over. So uh, there's two more questions. If we can keep it to under five minutes, I guess that'll be OK. And, it's, talk so much and, it, and it seemed that a lot of people didn't exactly know where Winthrop House was. So if it's OK with you, uh, while he's answering the questions, I'm going to draw a quick map on the board behind him so everyone can find him tomorrow to ask all the questions that they have that they're not going to be able to ask today. I want to thank you for your speech. Um, the gentleman over here raised the issue of the cost of the, of the, uh, to the individual uh, ratepayer for the water, clean water. And uh, I think it's very important because we were talking about it internalizing the externalities. And we are being asked to pay for an exorbitant waste of clean water. Uh, we sh bring it in from long distances and then we used to flush shit and send it at nine miles out into the harbor rather than using or some up banana peels. right rather than rather than composting or or using a uh, clivus multum type of uh, much cheaper but simpler methods of, of collecting our own externalities and and taking responsibility for them. I'm wondering if you you were concerned about how to use or you obviously must know economists in this area. Must there not be ways to now take the price differential between tying into the public system, which has turned out to be very expensive, but to create collectives for dealing with our individual wastes and expenses, whether it's energy or uh, uh, bodily products or uh, uh, temperature control and so forth, whatever, uh, and create economic units uh, that are cost efficient, more efficient than uh, being individualists about uh, our consumption and our uh, refuse yeah. creation. I think I understand the question. Again, it, it's, it's ours. To, to, to talk about it, and it goes back to a lot of complicated things. I think what you're saying, you know, is that individuals should be, hopefully have the more more uh, control over their own excrement, their own energy sources, their own all those things. And if they did, they might make better decisions because they're close to home. And I agree in general. I I try to get a bill passed in the Wisconsin legislature to allow people to have clevis multums in their homes. Clevis multums are a Swedish type of waterless toilet that composts, and they work very well. And uh, it turned out we couldn't do that because there was an old law on the books in Wisconsin that required every domicile to have a water closet in it. Water closet is an old-fashioned word for flush toilet. And uh, so I was made great fun of, as you can imagine, about my waterless toilets. And another, another issue is years ago, we made a decision in this country to build central power stations. It was the big fight between Edison and somebody else over AC, DC, and the big guys won. And if the big guys wouldn't have won, then we could have had cogeneration systems. We could have, uh, 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 people could have their own on-site fuel cell systems uh, producing both heat and, and electricity. A lot of smaller, more energy and technologically uh, benign systems might be possible. But we've opted for the, the big central kind of system. I, could, I, I couldn't do it because I'm not schooled enough to do it, but the proper uh, political scientists could go into a, an anti-capitalism tirade now and, and, and basically say that it's all the fault of big, bad, evil capitalism, uh, and maybe if we were socialists, it'd be better. I'm not sure that I agree with that totally, but there's no question that the capitalist 
monopolization tendency, which we know about and which we try to control through anti-monopoly laws, many of which have been defunct now, is, leads to the kind of problems you're talking about, of doing things the big way. You know, the, the giant nuclear power plant with all of its problems instead of the small fuel cell cogenerations in each, in each dormitory building, or the clevis multums, or the composting. I don't have any good answers for you. If you have an answer, tell us. But be, be brief, because she wants to talk. I'm well, sorry. I, I would think advocating a, um, either some kind of financing system to create these, uh, to take these technologies and help people join together and, and collectively reap the savings yeah. so we don't that's have to a, pay. That's a, that's a very good idea. The financing is often key. A number of third world countries who have managed to avoid the World Bank's big dam insanity are trying these things like this in a few successful places where they're giving small loans to people and, and entrepreneurs to do things more, you know, like to have solar stills to purify water. Very cheap, very practical in countries where they need pure water. And those can be done very cheaply and, and, and et cetera. And th 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 that is a very important thing. Another thing that I advocated years ago that California has done some of. California has one of the best energy laws in the country as far as utility, uh, a requirement. I would vote for, if I was a member of Congress for a law, and I know that that's command control and not popular now, but I do believe in laws. My Boston Harbor fellow may not agree with me, but I would support a law that would require every utility company to come to your house or your business, do an energy audit, then loan you the money to do what's required, storm windows, insulation, et cetera, and then charge you the loan payback on your monthly bill. It's been shown that in mo most cases, your monthly bill would be less than you pay now because you'd save enough electricity that over four, five, eight, ten years you could pay off the improvements that the utility loaned you the money to do, et cetera. That's the kind of thing of creative financing that would be a good idea. But our, we haven't done that in our society, even though it's been talked about for oh, at least 15 or 20 years. And, and some utilities in California are doing that, and they've been very successful. We get caught by our own petards. Uh, that happens with incinerators. You build a giant big incinerator, you put out 30-year bonds for $40 million, and then the, the, the damn thing is there, and the city has agreed to take in X million pounds of garbage a day. Then you set up a recycling system, and suddenly the city has to be anti-recycling, because if you, if you start recycling, there won't be enough garbage to feed the incinerator, which they got a 30-year mortgage on. That happens in many communities, and a similar kind of thing. Yeah. Sure. Um, thank you. I was just wondering if you could give us some brief highlights about your uh, talk on environmental justice. Oh, my goodness. Um, just a couple of highlights, well, please. Well, I, I talked at the environmental justice class. There are two topics <clears throat> that I would put under the general uh, uh, <clears throat> rubric, pardon me, of environmental justice. One is the classical environmental justice of, of where you put the incinerators in, in American communities. They go in poor neighborhoods, they go in black neighborhoods, et cetera. That ties into racism, ties into poverty. I didn't talk about that big, much, maybe two minutes, maybe, no, maybe 10 minutes, because that's what the class has been doing all year. I chose to talk because they hadn't talked about it, and the professor told me this ahead of time, about the international environmental justice issue, what's become known as the North-South debate. I prefer to call it the rich-poor debate. It, it began to service in Rio at the conference there where we rich countries are saying, stop having babies and, and, and so forth, and they say to us, stop polluting, stop driving air-conditioned cars, and a real schism is developed between rich countries and poor countries because they want to develop, and, and we want them to have fewer children, and we don't want to give up our air conditioners. And I used global warming as a case study, because global warming is currently, and there's some good papers written on it, I might be able to find one to give you a reference if you want, that, sh that show how this conflict arises. I mean, China, India, uh, Brazil want to burn coal like crazy and build cars like crazy because they want to get where, where we are. And if they do that, it's going to be a global warming disaster. We don't want to cut back. Uh, the OPEC countries don't want to let anybody cut back. And, and there's a very complicated policy situation around the global warming issue that deals with the, the justice. Who ought to pay? You know, should you, we, the rich countries, ought to do something, and we ought to be helping them develop in an environmentally more benign way than we did, but that's going to cost us money. Are you willing to pay taxes to do that? Are you willing to give up your air conditioner? 
So, so they won't want an air conditioner because they'll see that we're doing, you know, all that gets very complicated. Again, hours of discussion, I don't have time to do that. People have given up on the microphone, so you talked them into quitting. Again, thank you very much, and it's been a pleasure to be here and share the thoughts with you. Thanks a lot, Doug. And if anyone has any questions about Earth Day, I hope the, uh, the directions are semi-clear. Uh, we'll be free to answer questions for about five minutes. <laughs>